Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti-Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's. And welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello, everyone. Today's podcast is a bit different. My guest is Richard Pittman, who has joined me to talk about the incomparable Arkle. Arkle's last win was Ascot on the, on the 14th of December 1966. Richard rode the second that day, Sunny Bright. Welcome back to The Paddock and the Pavilion, Richard. Yes, it's exciting. I keep following you. I, I had a lovely, I enjoyed Tabitha Worsley. What a little star she is. Yes, I, I met Tabitha yesterday at Huntingdon. Well, with, this is going to be, this is being recorded, but we're going out on the 19th of December. But uh, it was a great pleasure to meet her yesterday at Huntingdon. So we're going to take you back, if we can, to 1966. Christmas is just coming up. I looked up and your weight in those days was nine stone 12. Um, you were a 23-year-old jockey. Um, England were the World Cup winners. And we're going to talk about Arkell and your, your day against him uh, on the 14th of December. But what was it like in national hunt racing when Arkell was about and when he was due to race in those days? It was just incredible. Um, the reception that Brownie Frost got at Sandown on Grenatine, um, he used to get those receptions when he was going out and in the paddock, when he came into the paddock, not straight away, obviously, because people didn't realise how good he was uh, until he had done his Gold Cups, etc. But it was, it was just magic. It, it was in a t- an era when I was just starting to get going as a, as a stable lad come, come jockey. And... I couldn't believe the strength in him. I was with Fred Winter in 64 when he started. And, of course, um, uh, Arkel, or himself, they all called him in, in Ireland. They didn't say, oh, Arkel's running today. Oh, himself's running today. So I was just getting going. And to see this wonder horse, I mean, first of all, when he was beaten by Mill House in the Hennessy, we thought Mill House was the next coming of the saviour because he's a great, big, strapping horse trained in Lambourne next to Fred Winters uh, at Foot Warwind. And he, he looked to be the archetypal Gold Cup horse. Well, it's the last time that Mill House saw anything bar his backside because Arkell then became practically unbeatable. I mean, his record, 27 wins from 35 races, you know, it's... It's tremendous, when you, especially when you consider that in the latter, not the latter days, the second half of his career, he was giving lumps of weight away. At 12-7, he often carried and others had 10 stone. Good horses. So it, it, that was the feat, I think, that puts him apart from anything we've seen since. I don't think he's comparable to best mate. He's so much better than best mate. I mean, best mate was campaigned tremendously well by Henry A. tonight to win three Cheltenham Gold Cups. There's no doubt about that. But he still wasn't in the same league as, as Arkell. Well, we'll come on to that a bit later about how he compares, or how they compare to him, really. But after speaking to Richard, I also caught up with Sean McGee, an eminent racing historian and the author of Arkell, the story of the world's greatest steeplechaser. Here are Sean's thoughts on Arkell's impact on national hunt racing. He had a huge effect because the, the key thing to Arkell, the Arkell profile and the history of Arkell and so on, really is television. Because in the, in the, by the early 1960s and that sort of period, you could watch horses like Arkell, Millhouse, really sort of famous horses like that. You could just see them as easy as anything by watching on the TV. And this was, a, in terms of prize money, it was going up because of sponsorship, the profile of racing, steeplechasing was going up. And, and the, the fact that this period produced one not, not horse who was not only outstanding, but was absolutely incomparable, 
gave the sport a much higher public profile than it otherwise would have been. It was making Arkell a public figure. He was a horse, but he was but still there was a he, there was an aura, a, and it's a real aura. When you look in my book, there's all sorts of amazing things that pe- people, uh, poems and theatre and songs and all this sort of thing. And what, what, of course, the key to Arkell was that he was Irish, and he was everything. Geared, was geared to to his being a public figure in Ireland, especially, but also in England. And when he when when he turned out to be absolutely pretty well unbeatable, of course this was this was a great uh, triumph for the, for Ireland. And um, though I was born in Hampstead in London, I still got enough of, in my English name to make make me part of the Arkle fan club. Now we return to Richard to talk about race day at Ascot in December nineteen sixty six. Uh, if we can go back then to this day at Ascot on Wednesday, it's Wednesday as well. <laughs> the 14th of, of December, 1966. What do you remember about the SGB chase? Well, obviously, by then, uh, Arkell's r- record and his imagery was fantastic. I was excited to be in the same race with him. And I obviously thought, there's no way I'm going to play clever jockeys and sit out the back and do him for speed because I wouldn't have the speed to beat him. So I lined up with him and, What impressed me being so close was the fact that he was made like a greyhound. He was fit and hard, carried his head fairly high because he was keen. Pat Taff, a lovely, gentle person on top of him. So I lined up pretty close to him, but saw very little for a while because he he could go at a fair gallop. Uh, He settled best in front. And then... I suppose he was taking what we now call a breather and I got towards him and then he just accelerated. You know when annoyingly on someone in an Aston Martin comes beside you on a motorway and puts his foot down and it disappears into the distance very quickly? Well, that's what Arkell could do. He, he just And he broke the horse's heart, you know. He, he The horse was, that I rode was no good anymore. And although we can't find it, Stephen, I remember riding a horse of Fred Winters called Solbina, and and I was positive I was second to Arkell at Sandown, but I, I can't find it now. Um, and again, that horse was no good ever after. So he he was a heartbreaker. And what do you remember about the horse you were riding there, Sonny Bright? He was a, a novice. He was a hundred to six, and there's they say five runners that day. Yeah, he was a big scopy horse. He was a good horse. We were pitching at stars, you know, trying to take on Arkell. But the owner was a, a good sporting man. The trainer loved chasing. And so we lined up there. But, I mean, that's why there were only five runners, because Arkell was so good. Yeah, I was but, going to come on to about the, the number of runners against him later. That was an insignificant uh, point you made there. Yes. Uh, I might preclude that then because uh, Ruby Walsh the other day said something about Arkell only beating 12 horses in his gold cup. <laughs> and that's because he was so superior, you know. I mean, it's irrelevant how many horses you've beaten. It's how you win is the importance. And Sean, what can you tell me about the SGB chase at Ascot on the 14th of December 1966? Well... Ascot had been the, a home of horse racing of, since 1711, Queen Anne, but only on the flat, and it was only on uh, 1965 that jumping began at Ascot. And, of course, people were very um, unused to it. An interesting little sort of snippet is that the turf, the, the actual grass, the turf uh, of the jumps course in Ascot was taken by the lorry load from Hurst Park, which had now become was defunct. So rather than throw the um, throw the grass, the turf out, they transported it to Ascot. And a lot of people think that the turf at at, at Ascot in that period was really high class. The first race over this said turf was in um, 1965, 
And so our call was, it was like, it was like that some famous horses had run there. His own stable companion, Flying Bolt, who was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant horse, on there, horses like Dunkirk. And it, it, was, a, it was a very exciting new manoeuvre. The, the complaint always about jumping at Ascot was that it's too remote. Somebody called it like Southport with the uh, tide out. You know, it's just, it's, 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 the actual it feels a long way away from you, sh- us, shivering in the stand. But people have got used to it, obviously, over the years. And it's now one of the best jumps courses, as, as well as flat races that there is. Arkell himself was coming off a very rare defeat in which he lost the Hennessy Gold Cup only a couple of weeks earlier, two and a half weeks earlier. Hennessy Gold Cup at Newbury. What about race day itself, uh, Sean? Well, the fact, the, the, the trouble with the Arkell SGB chase is that we had very little to go on. Uh, it was only in 1966, but the form book entry on this race reads, made all, fee, easily. That's it. And he just, there's a wonderful photo of him winning the, uh, jumping the um, water jump. Uh, which is again is in the book, but we can, the, the the source for information is is very often, of course, ex- exclusively in the form book, and this is a case of that you cannot. I've never seen a film of it. There's, there's no like some uh, of Arkell's races. Let's return to Richard, who then discussed with me about the other races on the card at Ascot that December day. As I said off air, I did a bit of research on this day on Wednesday. Um, it was the day, Wednesday the 14th of, of December. It was Long Walk Hurdle Day. That race was won by Josh Gifford. The first race um, was won by Bunny Hicks, who I looked up. He was the first jockey for Persian War, and this was Persian War's juvenile year as well. Yep, uh, Epsom jockey Bunny Hicks, yeah. And Persian War in, in the early days was as Epson. Henry Alpa owned him, didn't he? He eventually ended up with Colin Davis in Chepstow. But Jimmy Utley was his main rider, game Epsom rider. And Jimmy was a cocky little so and so. He used to come in the way room and say to all of us beaten up, squashed faced jockeys, You're all idiots, you lot. I only ride over hurdles. I can make a better living just riding over hurdles than you lot going around novice chases at clubs. He was quite cocky. And he, he said, um, jumping is irrelevant over hurdles. And a big bull of a horse like Persian War could knock one out of the ground, and not even draw breath. You know, he said, I don't need to know how to jump. He was quite, quite full of himself at the time. Well, the second race that was won by Stan Meller, Josh Gifford won the third race. Pat Taff won the fourth race, obviously, on Arkell. And the fifth race, you were on the favourite, Indian Spice, and you came third. Well, there's a good story behind him because he was my first ever winner at Fogwell Park as a jockey. I'd been four years with no winners, Stephen, as a professional. Um, I'd, I'd had 60 rides by the time I, I got on to uh, Indian Spice. And it was the only time that I was ever recognised in, in those days, pulling up for petrol. Uh, the attendant said, oh, I know you. You're the jockey who can't ride a winner, aren't you? Yes, that's me. So uh, just before we go off Indian Spice, he won at Fontwell by 12 lengths for my first ever winner. And you'd think after such a terrible four years, I'd be elated. And I was actually disappointed. And the reason being, he won so easily, I realised it wasn't magic. You didn't have to be the second coming of the good Lord, you know. It, you just had to be in the right place at the right time on the right horse and not make an idiot of yourself. So, I mean, this is that's being silly because the great jockeys steal races uh, that they shouldn't have won, whereas most jockeys would win on most horses. Well, that fifth race was won by David Sunderland. Yes, what a good lad. He used to ride, ride for the Courages, Edward Courage. Yeah, good lad. He sadly no longer with us, became a valet in the end. Tough, hard man, David, good jock. But I reiterate, you're only as good as the horses you ride. And and he rode well on the horses he got, you know, but there weren't that many. And I'm pretty sure, but 
looking at the records that the jockey who came fifth in that race was David Ellsworth. Yes, old Elsie. Yeah, he was. A, he was clever. Was Elsie always ahead of the game? You know, he could. He'd know the form book inside out and his own horses. Very, very clever man, and, and still is. I mean, small stable now, but he pops them in when they're wanted. And what was he like as a jockey? Um, he was all, like me, a bit, bit heavy, um, but um, he, he was cleverer than me. You know, he was a canny rider. Uh, he was a good jockey. And then the last race was won by someone who actually listens to this podcast because I know Viv and Des Briscoe, and Des won the last race that day. It was a juvenile hurdle uh, on Louis Boy, and the second horse in that race was Spanish Steps. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Good old, you know, it's great dragging these names up, isn't it? Yeah. Des Briscoe was a, another good jockey. More, you would say, a hurdle jockey than a chase jockey, but that's how the cookie crumbled sometimes. Um, but names, you know, I'm Gaga. I was 79 in January. I can't remember. I, I know people losing their memory can always remember long ago, but I can't remember locally and long ago. So <laughs> I'm in a funny old place. Well, I've enjoyed that little segment. I thought I'd, I'd get that in uh, because of all the names that were mentioned. And it uh, sounds like you did as well. But I want to go back to, back to Arkle. You've, we've already mentioned it before. But what, but what were his main qualities? He was just better than other horses. He could gallop and jump. The only mistake he ever made, one mistake in his career, was at Cheltenham in the Gold Cup. He was in front, 10 lengths in front, with a circuit to go coming round what would be the last. And Arkell didn't take off at all, didn't pick a leg up and parted the birch. And Pat Taff never moved a muscle. Hardly knew the horse had made a mistake because Arkell was such a bull of a horse and so full of exuberance. So the whole crowd at Cheltenham went, ah, ah, you know, when they saw the mistake. And Pat Taff probably thought, well, what on earth's going on? You know, but the horse, that's the only mistake I saw him. So he was an incredibly fast jumper. He could gallop uh, when he was fresh, so he often made the running. Uh, Pat could reel him back. I remember at, at Sandown, because he, he won the whip bread. Pat pulled him back over those railway fences and people in the crowd got excited. Uh, but he was just taking a breather. And as soon as he pressed the button, I go to the analogy again of a good fast car. The moment he put his foot on the pedal, the horse's willingness and wanting to gallop was evident, and he just cruised away. Great, great horse. But to to run all those years and only make one mistake was fantastic. Yeah, so you say, as as a steeplechaser, he won 22 of his 26 races. Only six horses beat him. And although Ruby Walsh mentioned this the other day I looked up and in the gold cups he ran against four horses in 64 well no, he running there was four horses in the race in 64 the same in 65 and five in 66 when he was 10 to one on to win the gold yeah. cup yeah yeah, yeah. but he, I reiterate you don't it's not the number of horses you know if you've got 40 also rounds you know they'd have never seen his, his smoke you know he'd have been gone so it, i think that's an irrelevant fact and how good were his owner trainer and jockey tom draper was a little wizened irishman and he trained him how people train horses now <laughs> and it, it it did change uh, it was just his facilities he used to be out only half an hour the horses out of their box whereas you'll get some old at that time some old-fashioned trainers say no they need to be out for an hour and a half you know a lot of steady trotting building up you know then a gallop and then cooling down well tom draper they'd whiz around the field full of thistles and things out the back and come back in that was the way he he did it and he wasn't just a one horse trainer because the second best horse in that era and maybe even in today's era was Flying Bolt, who he also trained. I mean, he won the, the champion chase one day and then third in the champion hurdle the following day, you know, and Pat Taff rode him again. So he was far from a one-horse trainer, but a, a very wise horseman. Now, the Duchess of Westminster, who owned him, it couldn't have gone up or couldn't have gone to a better, a better person because she so appreciated her horses. And I've got some old photographs that have popped up of 
her riding him in retirement because uh, he, he broke his pedal bone in his last race. And when he came sound, she had him at home and rode him. And there were some lovely photographs of him with her on board, you know, like the Queen, no helmets in those days, you know, headscarf and just sitting on Arkell's back on a bridge in Ireland and, or Cheshire, it might have been. Um, so great memories, good owner. And she also, remember, won the Grand National with the horse Hewell Davis rode for Forster. Last oh, suspect. Yes, who was a real old dodge pot. And Forster wasn't going to run him, and the Duchess wasn't keen. He was a thinker, you see. And uh, Hewell Davis badgered Forster. He said, he's got to run. He'll love it there. And he said, well, I, I don't believe in that. You, you phone the Duchess, and if you can convince her, the horse runs. And he did, and it ran. And it came through, there were a whole group of them still there, five horses at the last, and he came through them, which is what an old dodgy horse needs, something to galvanise him, something to aim at. And, and when you're going through a, a pack of horses, your irons clink with the person next door, you know, you can feel the, what they're bred to do. They're herd animals, they're bred to race just to keep alive. So... That was ideal for him. but So she was a great, great supporter of, of racing. Do you think they ever considered running Arkell in the Grand National? No, I don't think they did. Um, as I said earlier about um, Hugh Davis's horse, Last Suspect, <laughs> Duchess didn't want to run him. You know, he was a great big old, old horse that could go around there with his eyes shut. But Arkell was very keen... The fences were stiff in those days, and she was such an animal, you know, she loved her animals at home as well as in racing, and she wouldn't have subjected him to it, no. Because Arkell was named after a mountain on her estate. Yes, indeed. But as I say, for a horse to just be at the handle of himself, I think that is, that is great, you know. And did he run in all these handicaps? Because in those days there weren't the the grade one races to well, race in? No, he, he, he ran in all sorts of races. I mean, he won the first in 62, I think it was. He came to Cheltenham and he, he won the Honeybourne Chase by 20 lengths. He came back in 63, won the Broadway Chase by 20 lengths um, and then started carrying all these handicap weights because he was good. No, but that's the reason there were less runners in Hennessy's and things because of uh, people, or well, not sorry, more runners than Gold Cups because people thought they had a chance getting £35 off him. And I can remember him once, I think, carrying 12 stone 10. Well, these days, 11 stone 10 is the top, top weight. But the weight did not make any difference to him. When Stallbridge Colonist beat him in the Hennessy, a little grey horse ridden by Stan Meller, and a good horse in his own right, he was getting £35. You know, it's, you don't see that happen now. It was something that happened then. I don't think it was the, anything to do with the amount of races. It's what they wanted to do with him. You know, he'd run in, and win a big race and then run 12 days later. You know, they didn't molly coddle him, didn't wrap him up in cotton wool. That's another reason why I think that he is the best that I've ever seen and I've been racing since 1960. I then asked Sean what he thought was Arkell's best ever performance and also how one horse changed the national hunt handicapping system. Well, I and a lot of other people think that the greatest individual performance that he turned in was in the race called the Gallagher Gold Cup in Sandown Park in um, November 65. He was giving weight to some top-class horses, including Mill House, who is famous rival, and several other really top-class horses. And he led, it was uh, three miles, and he led. He sort of got into the rhythm of the race, and then when they came out to the, to the stands first time round, he got pushed, sort of, sort of pushed the other horses aside because he was Arkell and he was going to lead them. And it ended up with him winning by an awful long way, beating some very, very good horses. And it was jumping brilliantly. And um, we thought we had lost or 
we thought that some mates of mine and myself we have been looking for a um, film of this Jack Gallagher Gold Cup because it was such an amazing race and none, none of us had ever seen it. And then eventually somebody somewhere got hold of a, of a, it wasn't on the BBC, which was a bit of a drawback, it was on ITV as it was then, um, and is again now. And it was just sensational acceleration, giving over a stone to some top class horses. It was it was sheer, sheer class. I mean, people talk about class and it's very difficult to define. You know it when you see it and you saw it with him. And although he'd had some brilliant uh, performances in his time, this was a, this was from another planet. And they had to change the, the handicap system for, for yes, Arkham. Yes, that, that came much earlier. That came first, his first uh, race after the famous 1964 Jotlam Gold Cup when he beat Mill House. And he then went for the Irish National at Ferry House. And uh, the weights were, so, were, were if, you, if you handicapped that as a straightforward handicap race, it would have been, dis, it would have distorted all the other runners because they would be compressed. And so they changed, they changed the... Um, handicap rate regulations in order to accommodate if Arkell didn't win, win and if Arkell did a uh, run and it, and if he did run and it was to me and I think I've put, written this several places somewhere to me the idea of, a, of an individual athlete competitor changing the rules of his or her sport because they are so superior is ex- extraordinary I ended the podcast by asking Richard to summarise some of the other great horses and how they compared to the greatest steeplechaser of them all. So, of course I adore Quarter Star, and Desi captured everyone's hearts. But this horse could go left or right, had no quirks, just a the best I've ever seen. So I know you've said before you were very fond of... Uh, Captain Christie. Yep, he didn't get his recognition he was a Jew when he was a good horse. I remember him when he started. He was ridden by an amateur, Major Joe Pidcock, who rode longer than John Wayne the cowboy, you know, was about as stylish. Um, And in the end, of course, it it was realised that the, the horse was so good it needed someone better. But he, you know, he won a lot of good races. I made the mistake of thinking in the uh, King George when I won two on Pendle, I won't track him. He's going to make the money. I won't track him because he can miss a fence and I don't want to be left in front. Well, I never saw him again, beaten 10 lengths. And then he went, wins a gold cup where I fell on Pendle that brought down at the second last. Very good horse. He beat the Dickler that day in a tight finish. A very, very good horse indeed. Didn't get the recognition. You've mentioned about best mate, Lascargo, Corto Star, Denman. Why do you think they're not as good as Arkel was? Because of the weight carrying performances and the way that he did it. it. He didn't, giving two and a half stone away and more on a couple of occasions and beating good horses, not, not moderate horses, the way he did it under such adverse weight situations put him way above the others. I mean, <laughs> poor old Lescargo never got the, the credit he deserved. He won two gold cups and a grand national, but he was a leery old goat of a horse. You know, he, he looked miserable. He had blinkers on. He was 25 lengths third to Red Rum and Crisp. You know, okay, he did win one later, beating Red Rum, but... He didn't. I mean, two gold cups in a national, you'd think he'd be up there with a bronze and statue and things, but he just slipped through the, through the, it, he wasn't a friend of the media. They didn't like him because he looked miserable. And for the, for the national hunt uh, racing uh, spectator, it must have been a, a real tragedy when Arkel um, broke his pedal bone and then had to be retired. Y- yep. There was a gasp 
when when he hit a fence, actually that must have been his second mistake, hit a fence over by the stables way. Um, Dormant, I think, won the race in the end. It, we had a lot of racing coverage of him, a lot of film coverage of him then. And he was plastered uh, around the foot and then up to the knee. And he stayed at Kempton for some days. So there was a lot of media coverage. But my take on that is, Stephen, thank goodness it was only a pedal bone, which, is, you know, it's right in the middle of the foot there, very important. But had it been halfway up his leg, he'd have been a job to save. So, you know, we had it, we had the joy of him in retirement. But you don't think anything's comparable to, to Arkell? And would he have won no. in 67 in the Gold Cup if he'd have been fit? Uh, one would assume so. One would, would have hoped so. Yeah, he, he was just good. It was a magical time. I mean, I only brushed over the uh, way the public welcomed him because it was, it was just a marvellous time, Stephen. And they cheer when he passed the stands for the circuit to go. You know, it was just different. Well, thank you very much for sharing those memories about Arkell. Um, a very Merry Christmas to you and a Happy New Year. And thank you again for joining me on the Paddock and the Pavilion. Well, it's a pleasure and every day is Christmas. At my age, when there's more behind you than in front of you, every day is Christmas. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and now on Instagram at the Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Ah, feel the whoa with Listerine at BJ's. You can save $2.50 now on Listerine products like Total Care Anti-Cavity Fluoride Fresh Mint Mouthwash or Cool Mint Pocket Packs Fresh Breath Strips at your nearest BJ's location. Experience the feeling of a million germs zapped in seconds with Listerine. Discount available through December 24th. Save now only at BJ's.